this morning, I, I want to kind of tie up some loose ends that I've had swirling around in my mind for a while uh, and talk to you about mercy, meaning, and relationships. So, so three ideas, but hopefully you'll see that they all fit together really well. Um, and I want us to start in Mark 5. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to Mark chapter 5. There's a story here. It's, it's become recently one of my favorite stories in the Bible where Jesus meets with a, a man who is, who is demon-possessed, okay? And so I want to read through this and, and, and get the idea of mercy into your minds. And hopefully as we read this and walk through it, you can in some way identify with this, this demon-possessed man. So Mark 5, starting verse 1, says, They came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes, when he that is Jesus got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. And he had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces, and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. So pause there for a second. I mean, this guy is tormented. And in, in that area, he was considered dangerous. He was a menace to society. So he was, he was an outcast. And at times they chained him up, but they weren't even able to, to bind him, that the demons would, would take control of him to such an extent that he was able to break through the chains. And so the people in that area, as you can imagine, were were scared of the guy. Who, who wouldn't be scared of, of that type of person, right? They're afraid of him. And so he would he would live there off on his own in the area of the tombs, which is kind of ironic. I mean, he's, in a way, he's like a, a living, breathing dead man. I mean, miserable, spiritually dead, mentally tormented. Today, we would say mentally ill. Um, and there he is. And it says in verse 6, seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him and shouting with a loud voice, he said, what business do we have with each other, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. For he, Jesus, had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to, to send them out of the country. Now there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain, and the demons implored him, saying, Send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. Their herdsmen ran away and reported it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that happened. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, catch this, clothed and in his right mind. The very man who had the legion, and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine, and they began to implore him, they began to implore Jesus to leave their region. you got to get out of here. Which, as I read that, the other day, I thought, that's so strange. Why would you want to banish Jesus in, in light of what he just did for this guy? And I, I don't know that we can be sure of the answer to that question, but maybe it had something to do with the fact that these pigs were lost, uh, valuable livestock. Uh, maybe they were just, frankly, scared of his power. It was a disruption of the normalcy of their area. They were kind of content with this guy living off there in the tombs and and were threatened in some way by Jesus' presence there. Maybe in some ways it humbled them or made them feel small or, or confronted them with the reality of God in a way they didn't want to be confronted with the reality of God in their lives. Don't know for sure, but they wanted him out of there. And notice verse 18, the response of the demon-possessed or the formerly demon-possessed man. 
As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was imploring him that he might accompany him. So the opposite reaction. Hey, I want to stay with you. I want to be with you. Wherever you go, can I, can I come? And notice Jesus' response. Verse 19, he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Go tell people about my mercy. One last verse, verse 20. He went away, began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. And that's understandable that they would be amazed. They saw this guy. They knew what he was like. They knew the torment he was experiencing. They were afraid of him. They knew probably some of his story. And now they're hearing about mercy. They're hearing about Jesus and what Jesus did for him. And I thought about how, how much all of us are like that man. And that might seem really weird to say. No one in here this morning has experienced probably cutting themselves or lashing out or outbursts. Or, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you have. Maybe you have experienced it. But either way, there's certain aspects of the story that are hard to, to relate to. And yet, as I said to uh, friends, I was meeting with some friends this past week, and we were just talking about life, talking about ups and downs and all different challenges. And uh, I said, you know, I, I feel like we're all just one text message, phone call, or email away from insanity any given moment. <laughs> you guys agree with that? I mean, the right text message, and it's funny because as we're sitting there talking, text just bing, 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 bing started to come in from, from uh, this couple's children. <laughs> and uh, I could see them teetering on the edge of insanity <laughs> at that moment. I mean, it literally happened right then. I mean, we are just one little message away from insanity any moment. To be overtaken by anger, fear, greed. Lust to be just controlled, enslaved, consumed, tormented, to be living in the tombs, to be dead. We know what that feels like. We, even as God's children, followers of Christ, would be lying if we said we don't still experience that uh, on an all too regular basis and know the fragility of our state and that it doesn't take much to push us over the edge, to push us to the brink to bring us to a, a sense of insanity. And here we have Christ and his outpouring of mercy. And you remember what he said, hey, I want you to, I, I know you want to come with me. You can't. I want you to go back and tell your people about how I had mercy on you. You know what mercy is? Mercy is God seeing us in our misery, seeing us in our insanity, and caring, and coming to rescue us. That's what mercy is. It's God's goodness to those in a, in a desperate state. Mercy. Every week we come together to talk about mercy. We may not use the word, but that's what we're talking about. God's gracious intrusion into our lives. How much we need him. And how he continually comes, relentlessly comes for us. Just like Jesus coming for this man. Who nobody else wanted anything to do with. I was uh, listening to a debate this past week between Christopher Hitchens and Dinesh D'Souza. And some of you might know Christopher Hitchens. He passed away years ago, but he was one of the most well-known atheists of our day and has written several books. One of them is entitled, God is Not Great. And I think the subtitle is, How Religion Poisons Everything. So uh, a militant, hostile, and very intelligent atheist who, who has passed. Uh, years ago, he passed away. But one of the things he said in the debate was this. I want to read this to you. I want you to think about this. I want you for a minute to sympathize with the atheist. Here's what he says. There are all sorts of problems with our nature. Some people call this original sin. It's obvious we have some innate, inbuilt design flaws. But there isn't going to be some supernatural solution to this. And nor can it be supernaturally commanded to go away. And then he quotes a, a 16th century English poet who said this, you cannot create people sick and then order them to be well. You cannot create people sick and then order them to be well. 
And then one last section. He said this. And this is what religion does. Because it makes impossible demands on people and insists they believe in impossible things and obey laws that cannot actually be followed. That's why I accuse it of totalitarianism, the essence of which is the combination of authority with caprice or random rules and just oppressing people, being a tyrant over people. Christopher Hitchens, responding to his understanding of Christianity, not just theism, but Christianity in particular, and saying, here's the kind of God I perceive you have, Christians. A God who creates people sick and then orders them to be well, commands them to fix themselves. That's how he understands the Christian God. Sadly, although most would probably not say this, I, I think that's how many Christians understand the God of the Bible. I probably wouldn't see it in as negative a light as Christopher Hitchens sees it, but I think they do kind of view God that way. And I know in my life, I have and can even still tend to view God that way, as a tyrant, as a dictator, as a, a taker. We talked about it in Sunday school this morning. As a taker. And yet, when we see the biblical record in clarity, we see that God is a giver. God is merciful. God's created things in such a way that we have freedom, and so we can get ourselves into some pretty colossal messes, can't we? We can. But it doesn't leave us to, to rescue ourselves, to lift ourselves out, to solve our own problem of insanity. He comes to us through Christ. And he pours out mercy, doesn't he? Pours out mercy. So, as we get started, I want you to think about mercy. And I want you to turn now to another passage, 1 Peter, actually chapter 1, for starters. 1 Peter 1. And I want to say a couple things about our, our community here, our church here, our fellowship, our fellowship here, whatever word you want to use. Uh, we, we've had, over the years I've been here, it, it's going to be 10 years soon. Uh, it's already been over 10 for Don. It's going to be 10 for me this July. And over the 10 years I've been here, we've had a lot of turnover for different reasons. Sometimes it's people coming and going because of, uh, you know, thinking they want to be part of the, the group here, and then they decide they want to be part of another church. Sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's uh, military families who, who come and go because the military is moving them around. We're about to, to lose the Sheridans pretty soon, sadly. And so we've had a lot of that going on, which is always uh, a bittersweet thing to have people coming in and get to know them, grow in grace, and then they go. All different reasons people have come and gone. And, and, and in recent months, we've had a, a, a sort of a new batch of people coming. And so part of what I want to do, as I said earlier, tie together some loose ends is is, is – First of all, put the idea of Christ's mercy in your mind. Kind of solidify that as a, as a basis for what we're going to say. And then say a few things about how I understand, how we as leaders understand our, our community, our church, and what, what we're thankful for, what we believe is, is unique here. Not because of anything great about us, but because of who God is and what he's been revealing, teaching, um, and cultivating in our midst here. So... With that mercy foundation in mind, I want to look at First Peter a little bit with you. And, and you'll see, even as we go, go through this passage, the idea of mercy comes up several times, especially in the, in the beginning and the end of the sections we're going to look at. But with that, we're going to look at these two concepts, meaning and relationships. And the reason we're going to look at these two is uh, another interesting idea I heard. I've shared it before, but I'll say it again for those of you who haven't heard me uh, say this. There was, a, there was a PBS special years ago, and one of the leading psychiatrists of our country was, was interviewed, and he was talking about all the advancements of uh, psychotherapy, psychotherapy and especially um, psychiatry in terms of um, psych meds and things like that. And he said, hey, we've come a long way, and it's great, all these things that we can do to help people who are mentally ill. But, but here's how he concluded. He said, um, 
we still have this problem, though. We can't offer people the two things they need most. We can't offer them meaning, and we can't offer them relationship. What we do is clinical, it's sterile. We can't offer meaning, and we can't offer relationship. And, and that has stuck with me ever since I heard it, because I see, once again, in that, hearing from a, a, from a secular person, probably an atheist or agnostic, devoted his whole life to treating mentally ill people without any reference to God, hearing from him that there's something lacking. And in fact, these things that are lacking are extremely important, meaning and, and relationship. And, and I hear that and I think, wow, isn't it good that God has given us his gospel, he's given us his mercy, and he's given us meaning, and he's given us relationship. So I want to show you a passage that I just stumbled across with David McKell actually on the phone recently. <laughs> Uh, we were talking about some of these concepts, and this passage came to, I think, David's mind first. And I started looking at it and said, wow, this just ties all that together. So 1 Peter, start with me in, in verse 3 of chapter 1. We're going to jump around a little bit, and usually we'll go through more methodically, but we're going to jump around a little bit. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, there it is, mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. So that the proof of your faith being much more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Then notice verse 8. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you rejoice greatly with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. There is meaning. Meaning beyond this limited, fragile, finite world that we're living in. And these limited, fragile, finite bodies that we're living in, in this world. There is meaning that goes beyond, that transcends. Where God, God says, Here is, here's who I am. Here's what I've done for you. I've, I've shown you mercy. You now have a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You have this inheritance which is imperishable, the greatest value conceivable you have in a relationship with God that you'll enjoy forever when all this stuff here is wrapped up. It's, it's not going to fade away. It's protected not by anything in you or what you do or your power, but it's protected by the power of God, verse 5, through faith for this salvation ready to be revealed. And he says, in this you rejoice. There is, there is joy, as he say it, inexpressible in verse 8. Even though, for now, you don't see him. You don't see God. I talked about last week the concept of doubt. And we kind of hit that head on. We all have our doubts. And some of it relates to the fact that we can't see God. There's been times where in my life I've said, God, I wish you would just come and sit down and talk with me. Kind of like Job went through. Will you just talk to me? I got some things I want to ask you about in my life. And he never shows up. <laughs> and kind of like the story we looked at last week with Elijah, he, he speaks not in these powerful manifestations, but through the still small voice. Remember that? It says he, didn't, he wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the, the storm or the fire. He was in the, the still small voice. He says, you don't see him now, but you love him. You believe in him. He gives you cause for rejoicing. You hear the gospel message. You hear of the mercy of Christ. You have glimmers of clarity regarding just how insane you are <laughs> and can be. And there's thankfulness. That's the kind of God I have. So there's meaning. And I'll say a couple of things about relationship. We're going to jump ahead. So in between, just to kind of give you a little bit of the context, in between, he talks about how God is holy, and he invites us to be holy, which we tend to think wrongly as some checklist of these great 
deeds, good deeds, virtues, whatever, can relate to those things, but much deeper than that has more to do with how we view God and how we view people and how we treat people. And so we, we go into that now. Chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth, and that word obedience literally is listening under, it's submitting to. Since you have in submission to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Since you have in the submission to the truth, the truth we just talked about, who God is, what he's done for us, purified your souls for a sincere love. That interesting you might see in your margin, that word sincere could be translated unhypocritical or non-hypocritical love. Now he says, in this honest, real, transparent, non-hypocritical, not surfacy, but genuine, in that kind of love, now fervently love one another from the heart. Here's relationship. God's already given us this foundation of meaning that makes sense of everything we go through here, which is a tremendous gift. And it all comes from an understanding that he has conveyed to us, and it starts with his character, and the fact that unlike the Reasoning of people like Christopher Hitchens or even many in the church. God is not a taker. He's not a tyrant. He's a gracious giver. There's this foundation. And now in this truth, he says, there's a kind of love to explore together. A non-hypocritical, genuine, transparent love. Hypocrisy, in our terminology today, we think of saying one thing, doing another, can involve that. But in those days, it was a play actor, someone who wore a mask. He says, now you have an opportunity to take the mask down. To be honest about what's really going on. To fervently love one another from the heart. To have your, your focus shifted off of yourself and onto other people. And to experience the freedom of that. Self-focused is slavery, isn't it? God says, there's, there's freedom. I granted you now go and and love, love one another and love one another fervently. And then the last section we're going to look at, chapter 2. Let's jump ahead again. Uh, the, in between, he, he's talked about this imperishable word that has birthed us. In other words, the gospel is a, a living message from a living God to souls who were dead and are made alive. And now he says, uh, actually look at it for a minute because it is It's significant enough to even fit in here. Look at verse 24. All flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. You know what he's saying? You're small. You're weak. Your body is small and weak. Your, uh, your footprint down here is small. Your time down here is limited, short. Contrast between who you are, your puny little insignificant existence, and this amazing meaning that God has invested your life with in binding you to himself. It's interesting. And he says now, in light of all that, chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, putting aside all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. You know what these are? These are threats in verse 1. Two relationships. What would derail you? What would sabotage the relationships? I believe... We believe we had a leadership meeting Friday night, and David said, man, these, these relationships we have are such a gift to us, a gift of God's grace to us. Are they perfect? No, they're not perfect. We've got our flaws. We have our arguments. We have our spats from here to there, time to time. We do. But we're recognizing, wow, I'm experiencing the grace of God in these relationships with other people here in, in this church. 
What would short circuit that? Things like the listing in verse one, putting aside what? Malice, ill will toward people, a deceit. And that word has to do with uh, taking advantage of people and being duplicitous and strategic, manipulative. Hypocrisy, ironic in light of what I explained about verse 22 of chapter one. It's the same, it's from the same word. He says hypocrisy, the hiding, faking it, lying. All that stuff would completely derail and and sabotage your experience of grace in this community. Envy, wanting something that someone else has. Admiring other fans, thinking, well, if only we had what they have, whether it's materially or in terms of their gifts and talents and things like that, whatever it is. Envy, wanting more, 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 not content with who God made us to be and what we have. Resenting other people, feeling slighted and being jealous. And he says, no, slander. So, so speaking uh, negative, that, that word literally is just like speaking down or speaking against people. All threats to the kind of harmony that the gospel provides. And, and you might think these would be obvious. Like, okay, yeah, I don't want to do any of those toxic, poisonous types of things. But here's the problem, is that they tend to feel justifiable. I feel like we have a right to feel the ways we feel about people when we go on this offensive mode. It feels right. It feels justifiable. I've been slighted. I've been wrong. I've been overlooked. I've been whatever. But the point is not us. We just said self-focus is enslavement. It's misery. The point is a merciful God. And so he says, lay that stuff aside. And like newborn babies, instead, long for pure milk. Feeding. You need this feeding. What is the feeding? It is the feeding of the word, the feeding of the kindness of God's way says, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, he says, just keep feeding on it. It's your nourishment. And so that means whether it's through messages that we share, Sunday school, sermons, we're putting more and more stuff on YouTube and Facebook and our website and all that. It's, it's out there. Keep feeding on it. Keep listening and taking in the gospel. Keep basking in mercy. It's what this whole thing is about. It's, it's, it's provision of God for us to taste that and to continue on together in that mercy. And then the last section here, start of verse four. And coming to him, Jesus, as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And he's saying people who reject Jesus, they just trip over him. But for us who believe, it's like this, it's this solid foundation to stand securely on. So Jesus is presented as a stone, a rock. You've heard him referred to as rock, right? Then it goes on to say, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then we'll finish with verse 10, but notice the word mercy again. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You see that? The kind of mercy we talked about in the beginning of the message. The kind of mercy that looks like someone who's on the brink of insanity. <laughs> who comes to minister grace, kindness, relief, help. He says, you exist now to proclaim those excellencies. And you're in this context, this fellowship, where God is building this building. And the cornerstone, the foundation is Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done for you. And you now are individual little building blocks together. Join together in that. And he is constructing you. 
And whereas before you were trying to find your place and find your way, and all of us have experienced this to one degree or another, trying to find our place, whether it's in a professional context or a, a team that we joined up or some kind of club we joined up or whatever, everyone in this world trying to find their place in some kind of community or some kind of, some kind of group. And God says, here's the group. You were not a people and now you are a people. You're my people. Because of mercy, you're my people. You will forever be my people. And now within that context, God is building you up and you will experience that as love, fervent love for one another. Putting aside the malice and the hypocrisy and the envy and the slander and all the other stuff. Taking individual responsibility for that. Me taking individual responsibility for my attitude I can have toward people. And you taking individual responsibility for your attitude that you can have toward people. Continually re, uh, rebooting and, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of there? Refreshing ourselves like you do on your browser. Refreshing the gospel of God's kindness, of God's mercy. Delighting in it remembering and extending it and then looking for opportunities to serve to give to fit in I, uh, I'm not going to talk about this now but uh, at some point soon we're going to talk about passages like 1 Corinthians where it says uh, we all are gifted in different ways and uses the analogy or the illustration of a body and not everyone is a hand or an eye or an ear we're all different parts of the body and we serve different roles different functions here but God's created us to work together in harmony as this message, as Paul says, the love of Christ constrains us and leads us forward. So, so as we wrap it up here, I want you to think about this with me for a second. Just imagine, imagine a community of people who know you. I mean, really know you. I mean, see through the surface, they know the real you, the, the you that you kind of hide from other people. Imagine a community of people who really see right through to that. They see the good, the bad, the ugly. Imagine a community of people who, who know you, who see you clearly, and still like you. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine a, a group of people who are there for you when you, when you fall down, there to pick you up. A community of people who are there to, to push you when you need to be pushed. To hold you up when you need to be held up. Imagine people who are relentlessly for you. So that whether you win or lose, succeed or fail, they're in your corner. They want what's best for you. Would you say you'd want to be part of a group like that? There's not one person in here who would say, no, nah, that. Everybody wants to be part of a group like that. God's created the church to be a taste of that as an expression of his mercy, his love for us. Truth be told, as we've been saying all along, we're all limited. We're all one text message away from insanity. <laughs> we can't put confidence in ourselves. Paul said, I put no confidence in the flesh. But we have a God who is doing something powerful. <laughs> and a part of what he's doing is as we all learn of the gospel and learn of Christ, we are being built up in this community of that kind of relationship, that kind of, of friendship. And it's an awesome thing. And we get foretaste now, fully in heaven someday. But God's given us everything we need to know. To, to celebrate his mercy, to delight in it together, to share it together, to be aware of the, the uh, threats, to be aware of the, the pitfalls when it comes to how we can become self-focused, self-absorbed. And uh, I believe he has more, uh, more to come as far as teaching us, growing together, and doing life together. And, well, that means counseling, coming alongside, or just 
activities together, whatever that is. Lots of things that he's got in store for us. So I'm thankful for that. I hope that's encouraging to you. Uh, I'll close us in prayer. Let's pray. God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the, the time we've had this morning to pause and, and think about the truth. Think back to that Christopher Hitchens quote, God, and it's so sad to me that so many view Christianity that way and view you that way, view you as a tyrant, as a dictator, as one who's sitting up in heaven demanding things that you're not willing to give. And I'm thankful that you, you give to us through Christ absolutely everything you require of us. Pray that we would more and more delight in that, that we would taste and see that you are good, and that we would celebrate your great mercy. And as we do that, that relationally, that we continue to um, love each other, serve each other, serve alongside of each other, support each other, cheer each other on, challenge each other when we need to be challenged. And all that would be happening in this atmosphere of mercy because of your character and who you really are. So thank you for what you've shown us this morning. Thank you for how you've reminded us of what is true. As we go forward with, with people coming and going, I pray that we would more and more clearly and fruitfully um, walk together as a, as a church community here. So thank you for what you're up to again. And thank you for this group and everyone you've brought this morning. And be with us as we close our service with this uh, last song. In Jesus' name, amen.